Uh, Genesis chapter 3 this morning, we'll be looking at the first six verses. There's an outline in the back of your worship guide, if you'd like to use that to follow along. Entitled the message this morning, The Facts of the Fall. Reading from Genesis chapter 3, the English Standard Version. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, and that on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing here to the reading of his word this morning. You have just endured, as Minnesotans, another crushing, disappointing defeat. The Minnesota Timberwolves went out in five games against the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, Will, is Will here this morning? I was going to give him a hard time. There you are, Will. There you are, my brother. I just saw uh, 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 something on Facebook that reminded us that, you know, all of all the Dallas teams like the Mavericks have gone to the conference finals uh, here in the last year. The, the other, the Stars have gone to the conference finals. It's been 28 years since the Dallas Cowboys have gone to a conference finals. I just thought I'd remind you of that. I wanted to give you a little bit of encouragement there, brother, this morning. <laughs> but why do we have losses? Why do we keep following that drama. Uh, and I, I mean, I've had some of my own. I'm, I'm not a Minnesota fan per se. I didn't grow up in this part of the country originally, but I have my Bill Buckners. I, I have my uh, missed field goals and, and some of these things that, that we, I, I, we don't have Blair Walsh like, like you Vikings do, but you know, you, you have, it, even Bill has, has some of those uh, Aaron's, Aaron, Aaron Rodgers passes that, that went off and, and they, they didn't end up winning the game because of that. Why? Because in team sports, it's not just the individual that bears the indignity. When you play, you win as a team and you lose as a team as well. And again, I don't have to tell you Minnesota people about that. <laughs> but we, we know about that. We, we've shared those experiences. We, we know what that feels like. This has to do with the text this morning because what we're going to learn in this particular text is that it is Adam and Adam and Eve who sinned. But what I want to talk about this morning is this is what we often call the fall of humanity, the fall of man, the fall in the garden. This is also sometimes where we talk about a concept that sometimes is referred to as original sin, which a lot of times people tend to think of this is the, the very first sin, the original sin. But we know that that actually isn't true, that this is not the original sin. Why? Because as we looked at last week, Satan is also here in the garden. Satan possessing the serpent. This is a historical story too. This is not myth or allegory or legend. This is a historical account. We are approaching it that way. But Satan has already committed sin. This is how sin originates, and that's the term, that's why we use that term original sin. This is how sin originates in humanity. And the Bible talks about that, how we have inherited the sin nature from our father Adam. Other passages that would support that. This is the historical record in Genesis chapter 3 of how that came to be. But David mentions in Psalm 51, 5 that we are condemned for one man's sin. That's the first point 
on your outline if you're using that to follow along. God condemns us for one man's sin. And so David says in Psalm 51.5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And he's not talking there, as some might look at a cursory reading in English, to say maybe he was conceived illegitimately, maybe outside of a marriage relationship, so he was conceived in a sinful relationship. That's not his point. He's saying from the very time that I existed genetically, I had inherited that sin nature from Adam. Because I'm a human being, because God holds me responsible for that. This is actually drawn out and developed in quite a bit of detail if you want to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and I'll read a rather extended passage here of nine verses in verses 12 through 21. We'll make reference to them in more incremental detail here in a moment, but I'm going to read you the entire passage just so you can hear the context that Paul supplies for us here. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For indeed, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam who was a type of the one who was to come. Just stopping there for a moment. You need to listen to what he's saying. Sin takes place, as he says in verse 13, when there is law, when there is a command that is given and we transgress against it. You will not eat of the fruit of the tree. And then what do Adam and Eve do? They eat of the fruit of the tree. That's sin. But there's no law given. And so, how do we know that God is holding humanity accountable for that? Because it says, death, verse 14, reigned from Adam to Moses, even those over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. So in other words, God hadn't given explicit law. He had not come down uh, to Sinai and given Moses the two tablets of stone. God was still holding humanity accountable because of Adam's sin. That's important for us to note here, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Verse 15, But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many dried through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. That is a word that means that God has declared us righteous. That's what justification means. Verse 17, For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, through Adam, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous." Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. These are maybe technical terms. Friends, this should stir our hearts just the reading of this passage, not just the reality of the condemnation that we experience, but the reality of the justification, of the salvation we have because of what Jesus Christ has done. And we're going to develop that point here this morning in this message. Because God has condemned us for one man's sin. And yes, that is true. 
He has assigned to us that debt, the debt that Adam owed, and we now all owe because of him. And again, it is like, it's not just on Blair Walsh for making that field go, go wide left. It's on the whole team. They all walk off the team with that defeat because of what he has done. And in the same way, that's what happens for us with Adam. In the old McGuffey readers, I think, uh, I don't know, maybe one of you, Betty, did you use the McGuffey reader when you were in the one-room school? Okay, she did, actually. I, there, there's a good nod for us. But in that old McGuffey reader, the letter A for Adam used to say, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. And teaching the children the alphabet, they would also impress upon them the reality of this depravity that all of us as human beings are born into. In sin did our mother conceive us. And so, as it says in Romans 5.12, as we just read, sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. But people were held accountable for his disobedience. And so you keep reading there in verses 13 and 14. Death reigned, even without the law, because we are held accountable for the debt that Adam incurred. That's the point that Paul is making. That's the point that we're emphasizing happened after the fall of humanity in Genesis chapter 3. Everyone dies. And it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, comes judgment. Death is a reality, friends, that all of us face. We are paying that debt that Adam incurred on our behalf. We have accepted and we bear that loss because of his actions, because of his fall. Because of that, we are also contaminated by his corruption. We not only bear the consequences for Adam's sin, we continue to sin. We possess a sin nature because of what Adam did. We are brought forth, as, as David says, in iniquity. The wicked, Psalm 58, verse 3, are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. As much as we might like to say that cute little innocent, maybe Troy, Troy Ben is here this morning, you, know, you hold him and you cuddle him and you say, he's such a cute little guy, he's so perfect, he's so innocent, and maybe he is. But you know what? Nobody's going to have to teach him how to lie. No one's going to teach him to be angry. No one's probably going to have to teach him to say no. <laughs> when mom asks him to do something, when he gets to that point in his development. Because that's embedded in our hearts. That's what we know. That's our instinct. That's how we're created now because of what Adam has done. That's how we come into this world. And this is what Psalm 58.3 reminds us of. Paul says it to the Ephesians in Ephesians 2.3. The default position of humanity is that we all live in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and mind, and by nature, we are children of wrath. We deserve God's judgment for who we are, because of what Adam did, and what we have done, because of the sin nature that we possess. We are contaminated by corruption. And because of that, the children of wrath, Paul says in Romans chapter 2 and verse 6, God is going to render to each human being according to his works. And the wages of sin is death. He says again in Colossians 3.25, the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. In other words, God is going to say, well, I know what you've done, but I know you're dead. Or I know what you've done, but you're from the right, this right country. You have this right thing going for you. No, God holds each one of us accountable for who we are and what we have done. This is the reality of human depravity. This is the reality of the corruption that we have. We must pay the penalty for our sins. 
James chapter 1 and verse 15, talking about how sin unfolds. James says when this is how sin develops. When every man is drawn away by his own desires. When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's the King James translation that I memorized as a kid. And it's familiar to many of you. But the reality is this. Death is a consequence that each one of us deserves for sin. Death happens to everybody who has been born since Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. Death is the consequence that we bear. The penalty that we must pay. But here is the hope that comes through in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 21. For as by a man came death through Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Here, friends, is the hope. The penalty, the wages of sin is death. And that's not just for the really bad sins. You know, we might think of murder or sex offense or uh, robbing banks. You know, those kind of really heinous things. Genocide. That, yeah, nobody's going to argue that Hitler doesn't deserve uh, to go to hell for his sins. But we struggle maybe when we start to think about, you know, well, uh, it was just a little lie. Everybody kind of does that. Does God? But no, the wages of sin, all sin, is death. And that's the reality that each one of us must face. We all, all of us, need the hope of eternal life. The hope of salvation that Jesus Christ makes possible. Just as we are all condemned and find ourselves in the position that we are in because of what Adam did, the converse can also be true. Just like you can, the, the Vikings can lose a game because of Blair Walsh, you know what? The Vikings could win a game because of Kirk Cousins. Well, maybe before he signed with the Falcons. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but, but you can win based on somebody's good play and good behavior. And the whole team benefits, even as the whole team comes together to make that possible. Through the actions of one person, a team can achieve success. And what greater success could there be for us than to put our hope, to pin our faith on what Jesus Christ, friend, has done for you. The wages of sin is death, yes. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And how does He demonstrate that to us? How can we be made righteous by Jesus Christ? we can see through His perfect life. He learned obedience, Hebrews 5.8 tells us, through what He suffered. Jesus Christ, the Creator of the universe, the One who said, let there be light, and yes, there was light, was there in the beginning. He became a human being. John 1 tells us, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And yet the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And that truth was that He faced the reality of human temptation, but in every way was tempted like as we are, and yet without sin. And you see it recorded in the Gospels. For example, in Luke chapter 2, in verse 51, talking about the young boy Jesus, after he is lost in Jerusalem, they find him at the temple, and his parents are, are, are all in a tizzy, and they're saying, where have you been? And he says, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But what does it say after they find him? He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. 
he still had to follow the Ten Commandments. He still had to follow. Honor your father and mother. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. These are things that Jesus modeled for us. He was a perfect son to Mary and Joseph. And he would say this later on in Matthew 5, verse 17. Do not think that I have come, Jesus says, to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I'm going to live just by the expectations I expect everyone else to live by. This is how he lived. So, he says in John 8, 29, I always do the things that are pleasing to God. I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. He was the perfect, sinless Son of God who gave up His life on the cross. He shed His blood. What we remembered here at the table this morning as we remembered the broken body, as we remembered the shed of blood. He bought our salvation by His blood and by His death. The author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, perfect, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifice daily, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself. It wasn't just enough that he was perfect, that he was the sinless high priest. The sinless high priest also became, as John the Baptist would say, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He would become the sacrifice. And that, friends, is what we understand here that the Bible is teaching. Yes, Humanity has fallen, but yes, also humanity's hope is made possible through Jesus and his perfect life, his sacrificial death that benefits you and me when we believe, when we come to Jesus by faith. Faith, by the way, is really at the core, at the crux of what constitutes sin in the first place. If you go all the way back to Genesis 3, where we read the description of the fall. What, what, what did it come down to? The serpent says, you have been told this thing, one thing by God, but that's not the way it is. You will not surely die. You will become like God, knowing good and evil. And he tells them a lie, because they do die. Maybe not immediately, but that consequence comes upon them. What does that take? That takes her believing the lie and rejecting what God had said. It's a lack of faith that leads to action. A different kind of action. A disobedience to what God has said. And friends, really it's no different for any of us today. When God tells us, be angry and do not sin, and you get frustrated, and you lose your cool, you lash out at people, you stew in anger and bitterness, what are your desires telling you? You know, it's going to feel, that person deserves my wrath. That person has it coming. And we fail to believe what God has said when we should put away those things and be reconciled to God and to one another. If it is possible, as much as lies within you, live at peace with all. And we, we've, yeah, that's, that's, good. That's, that's for the religious people, but right now, God, if you really understood how mad that person was, how unreasonable and how irrational their behavior is, and we choose not to believe God and what He's told us, and we instead let our feelings go. Let our feelings and our desires take control. We know that honesty is the best policy, that we should put away lying and speak truth with our neighbor. And yet, in our feelings of fear and panic, 
We think, if we can just cover this up, if we can just misdirect somebody, maybe I won't have to bear the consequences for whatever this situation is. I won't have to deal with the reality. And we let our fear and our desires take over and help us choose to make a different option instead of believing what God told us to do. That's what sin is all about. It's rejecting God's truth and following our own direction instead. This is what Samuel would tell Saul as he was caught in his own sin. Rebellion is as the sin of divination or witchcraft. And presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. That's the reality. All of our sins are just as equally bad in the sight of God. When we don't believe, that's what we're doing. But when we do believe, that's all that is necessary. To believe that yes, our sins deserve consequence. But as sometimes as we sing around here, our sins might be many, but God's mercy is more. God gives us forgiveness. Jesus Himself says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him has faith, will not perish, but have everlasting life. Eternal life. You will live forever. No conditions, no other things, but to turn from your sin and to trust in Jesus. And Him alone. That's what faith is. It's believing I'm a sinner. But Jesus is a greater Savior. So yes, the reality of the fall is all of us fell in Adam. But the converse is as equally true. All of us can have salvation because of what Jesus Christ has done. All of us can be made righteous by one man's act. One man's sin may have condemned us, friends, but one man's obedience saves us. And that's what you should leave here remembering today, is that salvation can be yours. What we remembered here at the communion table this morning, his broken body, his shed blood, makes possible your eternal hope. And friend, if you don't know Jesus Christ, we want you to know that He can take your sinful heart and change it, make it new when you believe in Him for eternal life. Father, we do thank You for this hope of the Gospel, that You were our Creator. You were the One who made the world and everything in it. You made it perfect. You made it sinless. You made us perfect and sinless, and yet we fell. We fell because of Adam. We fell because of our representative. And yet, you gave us a new Adam to put our faith and trust in. We've all faced the reality of death, but we can have life. We can have hope. We can be restored to what you intended us to be through our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for that hope of salvation that we can have by faith in Him, by confidence in His shed blood on our behalf. And so, Lord, we pray that we will rejoice in that salvation, those of us who have believed, and that You will work in the hearts of those who may just be hearing this or maybe just be drawing that conclusion that that's something that they need to do. Help them to know that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. May they not leave here today without making that true and certain for themselves, we pray in Jesus' name.